there are so many differences between men and women in Alzheimer's disease. I mean, at the core of it, the disease is very much the same across all people. But then when you begin to break it down into the effects of different risk factors, you begin to see significant differences. From the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology, this is Lessons in Lifespan Health, a podcast about the science and scientists improving how we live and age. I'm Sean Curran, Associate Dean of Research. And I'm Orly Bellman, Chief Communications Officer. On today's episode, we hear from Professor Christian Pike and how his research on sex differences in Alzheimer's disease can help inform how we might one day prevent and treat it. More than 5 million Americans are currently estimated to be living with Alzheimer's disease, and while aging is the single greatest risk factor for developing the disease, nearly two out of every three people afflicted are women. USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology professor Christian Pike studies this disparity from several angles, including examining a gene variant called apolipoprotein E4, or ApoE4. Anyone with ApoE4 is at greater risk for Alzheimer's compared with people with other versions of this gene. But women with ApoE4 are impacted more than men. Professor Pike spoke to us about his work trying to determine why this is. So right now, a main area of focus in my laboratory is looking at what ApoE4 is doing and comparing that between males and females to give us a little bit of insight into why it's affecting women more and to use that information to understand how it is that ApoE4 is driving the disease and that can give us insight into how to develop strategies to uh, stop it. Pike reports that Alzheimer's disease risk increases with the age-related decline of estrogen in women and testosterone in men. He is leading studies on ApoE4 and estrogen loss just before menopause. But he also wants to take a step back to our earliest stages of development to better understand hormones, male and female brains, and how they might interact with ApoE4. So one of the main areas we've been thinking about is rethinking sex differences as not just being age-related loss of hormones, but rather during very early development, which begins in utero and then shortly after birth, that as the body begins to develop into a male versus a female, that what happens is the brain also becomes more male-like or more female-like. And then considering that some of the differences in the risk for Alzheimer's disease may be related to those early changes, and then some of the differences and the effects of ApoE4 may also be related to that. So that's one of the key areas that we're looking at and doing some really, really cool things. One of those cool things includes a twin study being conducted in collaboration with USC professor Margie Gatz that looks at whether the male or femaleness of your in utero environment can impact your risk for Alzheimer's. So the, the idea was, can we look at the risks of developing Alzheimer's disease if you're a woman and you are a fraternal twin, whether or not you had a sister as your twin or a brother as your twin. And if you had a sister, then they relate, the whole environment would be relatively more feminine and, if, and that would make your brain relatively more feminine and you might be at greater risk. Conversely, if you had a brother, you'd be slightly more masculine and that might give you some protection against the disease. Further, you can back up and say, well, what's your genotype? Are you ApoE3 or you're ApoE4? And is there a relationship between those things? So right now, part of our project is going through and, and analyzing um, thousands of, of twin sets uh, and asking those questions and a variety of other questions along those lines. And, and the, the initial results um, are, are absolutely fascinating. Pike is also leading parallel lab studies modifying levels of male and female hormones in mice with ApoE3 or ApoE4. And then the question is, what happens now if we make this just a very brief manipulation during critical periods of development? What happens now when those animals are adults and they develop pathology and cognitive disturbances, very much like Alzheimer's disease? We already know that those mice with the ApoE4 have worse pathology. The females have the worst. Female ApoE4 have the greatest amount of pathology and male ApoE3 have the least amount of pathology. Can we push those relationships by just tweaking the, 
the levels of hormones during a very early window. So those, those are the kind of things that are ongoing. If Pike turns out to be correct that differences in women's brains make them more susceptible to the effects of APOE4, his next question is to understand why. What we think is going on is that APOE4, are, um, that gene is really important in regulating the function of the brain's immune-like cell. It's a cell called a microglial cell. And what we know is that if you have APOE4, for example, you're more likely to respond to different immune challenges with a greater inflammatory response. Um, and these sorts of immune challenges and inflammatory responses are implicated in development of Alzheimer's disease. So one of the things we're focusing then is comparing what's happening with microglia if they're from males versus females, if they're from an APOE3 genotype or an APOE4 genotype, and how that's affecting um, the ability of microglia to do their protective job and their, what goes wrong with the microglia when they fail to be protective and they actually turn towards um, a, a role where it drives the disease progression. Much of Pike's work highlights just how little research has been done on differences between males and females. There are so many differences between men and women in Alzheimer's disease. I mean, at the core of it, the disease is very much the same across all people. But then when you begin to break it down into the effects of different risk factors, you begin to see significant differences. And in recent years, there's been a greater emphasis on sex differences. And the more we look, the more differences between a male brain and a female brain that we find. One issue is that research subjects have historically been male. Um, and there's just been an, a kind of a an upswell of interest in this area. And the NIH a couple of years ago um, realized this and began to look at a few drugs in particular that, that people are taking, prescription drugs, that worked almost you know, qualitatively different between men and women. Said, so, you know, it's not okay for us to do all our research in just men. I mean, 90% of the uh, experimental animal research is done in males. It's men are easier. They're simpler. Just do things in men. And that's just not okay to do anymore. And now, as people have begun to include females and males, they go, oh, wait a minute. It's a lot more complicated. And if it's more complicated, maybe there are situations where the disease, although it's the same disease, it works a little bit different in men than it does in women. And maybe we should consider that in terms of the risk factors for developing it, and even how we approach it therapeutically. Pike's approach to looking at early development may also lead to new ways of thinking about treatment and prevention, ones that begin before Alzheimer's disease starts to develop. If you look at clinical trials of Alzheimer's disease drugs, almost all of them have failed. The failure rate is over 99%. Those are very, very expensive for the drug companies to run. And it's, it's a losing game. And there's a variety of reasons for this. I think one of the reasons that many of the field, including myself, believe is that we might be having the correct targets, like reducing the amount of beta amyloid or reducing the amount of tau. But we tend to, we've historically been starting these clinical trials when the patients already have early stage disease. By that time, their brains are already full of plaques and tangles. There's so much pathology I think a lot of the damage has already been done. And what needs to be done and what is starting to be done is finding people who are at high risk. So for example, people who have two copies of APOE4 and beginning treatments on them in their 40s or 50s, decades before, because we have evidence that the, that the underlying pathology starts a couple of decades before the clinical manifestation. Start interventions much earlier, maybe we can prevent them. But that becomes very difficult because now you're talking about a 20-year clinical trial. Um, very expensive. So I think that Alzheimer's disease, in terms of what we know about it and our ability to cure it, or at least prevent it, slow it down, um, has greatly increased. The difficult step of taking which of those strategies are going to be most effective and finding the right ways to test them, that's the difficult part. And I would say that one of the hopes I have um, to kind of speed up that process is that the area of, of imaging and biomarkers has greatly increased in the last few years. In the meantime, Pike says there are steps we can all take to keep our brains and bodies healthy. 
what I always tell people is there are things that we do know that you can do. And a lot of those are more lifestyle. So it's things that tend to be good for heart disease and so many other conditions. Just eat better. You know, exercise more. If you if you have a, a, a more Mediterranean style diet, if you keep away from the fats and the sugars, if you do a lot of physical exercise, if you do cognitive exercises, um, those are all um, very helpful. Sleep is incredibly important. As you sleep, your body naturally clears away beta amyloid and tau, the two proteins that are driving the pathology. So if, if you can just live better, um, that's this way you know, that we, we look at lifestyle factors and how they interact with genetic risk factors. You can't control what your genetics are, at least you can't yet, but you can control your environment and your lifestyle, what we call modifiable risk factors. And so what everybody can do is deal with those now um, while, we're, while we're waiting to get the, uh, the treatments. That wraps up this lesson in lifespan health. We'd like to thank Professor Christian Pike for his time and expertise. And thanks to all of you for listening. Join us next time for another lesson in lifespan health. And please subscribe to our podcast. Learn more about us at lifespanhealth.usc.edu.